We're so glad to have you here tonight. My name's Colleen. I lead the programming of the battery and I've been looking forward to this one for several months now. This is Hollywood Eden, the rise of Southern California's musical mythos with author and music critic, Joel Selvin. For those of you who don't know, Joel is an American San Francisco based music critic an author known for his weekly column in the San Francisco Chronicle, which ran from 1972 to 2009. Joel has written several books covering various aspects of pop music, including the New York Times bestseller, Red, My Uncensored Life in Rock with Sammy Hagar. Selvin has published articles in Rolling Stone, the LA Times, and Billboard. Joel's new book, Hollywood and Eden, which is out today, is the story of a group of young artists who came together at the dawn of the 60s to create a lasting myth of the California dream. We're gonna drop a link to the book in the chat, um, including uh, the opportunity to purchase an autographed copy available at Copperfields in Petaluma. And tonight, Joel is joined by David Katz Nelson. They will be talking about the book, stories from the book and other gems from Joel's experience in the music industry. Before I hand it over to David and Joel to get started, just a couple of logistics. You'll notice that you all are muted um, we're going to keep it that way just for now since it's a big group, but please use the chat to ask questions and discuss anything with other members of the audience. We will do a Q&A towards the end, so send any questions you have via the chat during the talk or you can save them for the end and we'll run through those. We're recording tonight's talk and we'll share a link um, following tonight and it'll be posted on our Battery YouTube page. So I think I've covered all the basics and I'll hand it over to Joel and David. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna start things off by welcoming everybody. Um, I'm just looking at all you beautiful people. Some of you who I've known for a long, long time. Bob Merlis's dog is here tonight, and we're very, very happy to have have the dog. And um, it's just good seeing everybody. Um, it'd be really much nicer for us to be together. Joel, you are experiencing your 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 coming out party on zoom this is a different thing for you uh, it, how does it feel um to have a book coming out into the world and you know during this crazy moment that we're all in together oh you know everybody's reading again <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> that's true but you can't you can't be uh you can't be at a, yeah, at a bar signing books uh you know hugging the flesh and all that kind of stuff though it's, it's it feel like it, like any other day for you today um, no, because of uh, this event is is definitely you know we talked about this, David. This this is this is the publication party, and yeah, this is 2021, and here we are uh, on this weird internet uh, hookup. But uh, I, I bet we're back to book signings again soon, and yeah. uh, you know pressing flesh and 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 you know handing out tchotchkes to bookstore managers, um, but. Uh, yeah, you know, let's have some fun. This will be interesting. It's novel. We're all going to remember all this period of our lives. You know, like, did we really? Yeah, we did. I am. Um, I'm encouraging everybody to grab if you if you're into it, grab a drink. This is a book celebration. This is more than just an interview. And you know, I'm I'm coming to this with understanding that probably everybody here has bought the book already. Although if you haven't, right in the chat, that is where you can purchase it. You can purchase it. There you go. Look, there's some people who've already gotten it. But I'm, I'm going to try not to give away too much while we dig into the story. Um, you know, this is this is an incredible story. It's an incredible story. It's a story about a period of time that changed the music industry during a changing music industry. Um, you know, Joel, how, if, if, how are you describing the book to people? You know, I'm sure today you've been asked this tons of times. How are you describing the book to people for people who are literally either just getting it in the mail or have just ordered it on Amazon? Yeah, kind of a different way each time. Uh, it, it starts in uh, the 1958 high school class at University High, a group of very privileged uh, kids who were growing up in what I think was probably like the perfect storm for American teenagers. Uh, and this group of people that knew each other in high school, Jan, Dean, Nancy Sinatra, um, Kim Fowley, the going to become a record producer, and Bruce Johnston of the Beach Boys, and Sandy Nelson, the drummer. I mean, not to mention uh, Ryan O'Neill and, and, and James Brolin, the actors, they were in that class. And so was a, a young girl named Kathy Coner, whose father 
uh, translated her diaries into a best-selling novel called Gidget. That was her nickname at the beach. Yeah, the real Gidget was in this class. Uh, and from these humble beginnings of their interest in rock and roll, there is a journey that builds up and leads to the recording of Good Vibrations by Brian Wilson, which is <clears throat> arguably the greatest pop record ever made. And that's sort of that's sort of the story arc. There's a lot of things in between. Let's let's talk about the story arc for a minute because you just mentioned so many Hall of Famers in the music world. And for anybody who collects records, you just mentioned about at least three or 400 records that you're gonna have to go out and buy immediately if you don't have them already. Well, there um, is a Spotify playlist. There is a spot. Well, and at the very end of the book, there's actually another playlist and there's some stuff not even on Spotify on that playlist. So, yes. you know, there, there's some good stuff there. I, I encourage everybody to read the book listening because it really got, it kind of gives a, a, a feeling to the whole thing. But I want to say, you know, literally first paragraph, last paragraph, Jan Barry, he is to you the the through line of this whole thing. Why did why why did you feel like that? And in a way, you know, why what was your epiphany moment of that's what you wanted, that's who you wanted to be the the through line of the whole thing? Well, uh, the the it just was obvious, frankly. I mean, uh, the, the, he was the very beginning of the idea of studio conceived rock music in Los Angeles. And, and he took that from very primitive amateur recordings he made in his garage on tape recorders that were owned by Howard Hughes to developing a group of session players and uh, uh, regiments at various uh, professional studios. They would be followed by many, many, many people in his wake. And there, some of those are still in place to this day. But Jan Berry was the guy that showed Brian how to hire session musicians, how to stack vocals on top of each other. He was ahead of the class. Um, his, un, uh, uh, if he hadn't turned into, uh, you know, lost to sort of pop moment, about 1965, he would be thought of uh, in the same terms as Brian, but you know, he, he, the, the Jan and Dean records went, you know, went kind of corny. Yeah, and I, and, and I actually think you're absolutely right. I think that his, one of the things that your book shows is his gift to the music scene, you know, and, and how it was really the, the, the Brian Jan thing were so, were so influential to each other. It was just, it's absolutely incredible. Um, there, one of the things that uh, that I absolutely love about this book is that you capture this ethos of by day you're going to high school and then in pre med and by night you're having hits and hanging out with gangsters and that whole thing, right? Um, is this the story that that really triggered you wanting to write this book? Was that was that was kind of like kind of totally understand. there's a period there's a part where they're they're going on tour and they're having these huge hits and yet they're in the car throwing M and M's at each other. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely nuts. It's like, was that where you felt like, oh my God, I wanna, I gotta write this book, you know? I think the trigger point was seeing the yearbook from University High. I, I saw Kevin Walsh out there in the gallery. Uh, he's a, a, a long standing friend who has an amazing collection of all kinds of ephemera uh, among them high school yearbooks. And the, the University High yearbook was like, a revelation, the idea of this group of people in this time and this place just knocked me out. And when I started to follow that thread, there was a very simple story that, that, that just developed right out of it. And, and um, but there was the other high school too. I mean, you know, when you, when you, when you open up the book, the first thing you're going to see is all the players kind of rolled on down. I mean, the university was just one of the high schools there, but uh, there was the, uh, the other high school, the rival high school as well, that had a ton of people that came out of it as well. And it was just, it was just uh, it's just an incredible story. Well, there were um, high schools all over uh, Los Angeles need to say, in fact, uh, the, the high school in Venice has a, a statue in its courtyard uh, of, of, uh, uh, that was modeled by a 17 year old Myrna Loy. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, and and Fairfax High, yeah, you know, uh, Flea went to Fairfax High. He played trumpet in the school band, and he told me that uh, 
that uh, sheet music in in the uh, school library still had Herb Alpert's name on it. Oh my God! And for those of you who haven't read the book, you get to see the the ascension of Herb Alpert as he's with you know um, with Lou Adler at the very beginning and how they kind of split ways and also both created legends for themselves. You know, let's let let's let's back up for a second and kind of set the pace, right? One of the things you kind of feel is that everybody was getting deals back. Everybody was doing songs in their garage. Everybody was getting deals. Like the deals were like being like handed out like popcorn almost. What was the music industry like at the start of this, uh, of this, of this epic of yours? Well, in Los Angeles, there was not much of a music industry. Uh, there was Capitol records, but the music industry was located elsewhere, largely in New York. Um, the, what record companies there were, were little independent run out of storefronts, a lot of them on Vine Street. Uh, there was a thriving rhythm and blues scene uh, and, you know, Kent Modern, RPM, the Bahari brothers had all the B.B. King records and uh, Ike and Tina so much and, and uh, Imperial, which was run by, a, I think he was a furniture store owner who saw an opportunity to sell records to the Latin and black markets, and and he got very lucky. Uh, he had a, he had a good rhythm and blues program run by an A and R guy named Eddie Ray, and when rock and roll came into the picture, uh, he already had Fats Domino making the same kind of records that he had always made turn into a multi million star. And then he also picked up Ricky Nelson uh, because it, it, as an adjunct to a TV show, his, his dad was looking around to find where he could uh, get Ricky's. Uh, record deal and the capital was out of the question yeah so you know, yeah, yeah the, the, the record business really didn't exist uh in in uh los angeles the jenny lee the the first jan berry hit record which was by jan and arnie uh mm -hmm. was put out by uh arwen and arwen was a small label that had just started by uh doris day's husband who uh thought it would be a good tax loss <laughs> well, let, let, let's talk about those early days as well, um, because it's amazing. I'm in the middle of doing a project around specialty records. And so, you know, on the way over here, I was actually listening to alternative take of Percy Mayfield's, please give me someone to love and please tell me someone to love. And then there's John Dolphin who plays a critical part in this. So you have these young kids hanging out with a John Dolphin type of character. Can you kind of paint the scene for those of us who have not, oh, there's a hand going up. Um, can you paint the scene for some of us who have don't know that as well? Well, that's the, that's the end of the second chapter. Uh, yep. a, um, John Dalton owned a record store in South Central Los Angeles that was kind of a community hub in the black community. Uh, it was open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, and over the course of the last couple of years, 55, 56, he, he discovered a phenomenon of white kids showing up at his record store to buy the rhythm and blues records came as a complete surprise to him. Elvis Presley showed up there in 1956. So he, he runs into uh, the, uh, these kids in the studio for the first time and they're out of University High. It's Bruce Johnston and, and Sandy Nelson, a uh, sax player named Dave Shostick. They found a, a guitar player who was well known to Dolphin, uh, Arthur Wright, a little bit older guy who was in Roy Milton's band. Uh, and they were cutting some stuff and Dolphin was like thinking, you know, white kids, this is interesting. He says, come on down to my office. And they get down to the office and uh, some outraged uh, singer who was a little delusional and thought Dolphin owed him a bunch of money, burst into the office and shoots Dolphin five times and kills him. Bruce Johnston, 17, 16 years old, has to pick him up off the heaters and, and say, are you all right, Mr. Dolphin? You know, so that was their first day in the record business. And, you know, let's talk about Bruce Johnson for anybody who follows it, you know, major beach boy, been there for a long time. But one of the things that I learned from the book, and maybe this is something that everybody knew already, was what an impact he had on the whole sound. He was like one of the first guys on it. And by the time he kind of kind of gets into the book, like you really dig in, he's already had a huge career for himself. You know, as I yeah, no, Bruce is an unsung hero of rock and roll. I think most people think of him as this guy who joined the Beach Boys sort of late in their uh, era. Actually, he, he walked in on the session for California Girls. That was his first Beach Boys session. Nice place to start. 
But yeah, he'd all, uh, long before the Beach Boys existed, he'd already had a, a, a career as the band leader at El Monte Legion Stadium, where he backed up 17-year-old Richie Valens as a house producer and arranger at Delphi Records, where he did Little Caesar and the Romans and, and a bunch of different projects. And he had his own records out when you know 1960 61 and then 62 he was very early on the surf music thing do the surfer stomp was major record in los angeles and so he came to and and then of course there was the whole bruce and terry uh bruce and terry melcher who was doris day's son and had a job at columbia records did a whole series of, of beach boys imitations so by the time he came to the beach boys he not only had this estimable career, but he was probably the most trained, most knowledgeable, and most skilled musician in that group. And were you able to interview him for the book? Oh, Johnston was hilarious. He was all over it, mostly by email. You know, he was the, in, on the road with the Beach Boys, and, you know, he'd be in France one moment and Canada the next. And But uh, you know what's it, what, what was interesting about um, Bruce, and I got him on the phone, because, you know, you're the only person I've talked to who liked Kim Fowley. You must explain that. <laughs> I know, it's true, it's true. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to ask you what Bruce thinks about his legacy. Does he have any thoughts about that? Before we get to Kim Fowley, because we'll get I to Kim. I don't know that Bruce has a lot of thoughts about anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, so there, there are a couple antagonists in this book, or there are a couple of people I should just say are colorful. I mean, the music industry is, is, is full of the greatest antagonists known to humankind. Um, Joel, did did you ever have a? I'm sure you had a, you've had many run-ins with Kim. I mean, before you did this, yeah, like, what, what what was your what was your impression of him when you first when you first got got to know that guy? Well, he was uh, uh, utterly fascinating and creepy at the same time. Yeah, and he had a, a, a line of patter that just wouldn't stop. Uh, so. It, it, it was pretty easy to engage in Fowley and, and a lot of the of, of the insane things that he talked about actually happened and were true. So well, that, that's what I got out of your book, because, you know, as a young A&R person in Los Angeles, who especially signed a girl group band when I signed the Muffs, he sought me out and he would corner me and he would tell me stories. And I thought he was full of it, you know, and uh, they're right there on the pages that you wrote. <laughs> no, not entirely. No, but I mean, I can't bring up Kim Fowley's name without mentioning that he is very credibly accused of raping Jackie Fox of the uh, Runaways. Uh, I totally believe Jackie's story. Uh, it's well within the boundaries of my understanding of Kim Fowley. And it just, it, it shows that he, as, as a young kid, he was problematic and difficult and, and antagonistic and, and, and creepy, but he got more so as he got older and, you know, Kim Fowley, not a good person. No, no, he's not a good person at all. And yet he had such a profound weave into the, the story that you tell. You, like, you can't get rid of him like a leech almost. He's, he's, in, he's in it. He's a classic Hollywood character. I don't think he could exist anywhere else. And of course, he's, you know, the spawn of, these, uh, of, of a movie actor who had a hundred roles and nobody ever knew him and, and a... Uh, uh, movie actress who uh, opted to marry well. I mean, classic Hollywood background and uh, probably had no distinct, obvious talent. You know, he, he couldn't sing, he couldn't write, he couldn't produce, he had to have help on everything he did. But somehow he stayed in the game and always had his fingerprints on something. And, and, and that's just not going to happen in New York City. That's a Hollywood story. That's a Hollywood story. That's absolutely right. Uh, another Hollywood story is uh, Phil Spector, who plays prominently in, in another problematic character who plays prominently in, in, in the book. Um, when I was working with Lenny Warnocker, he always told me about in the 60s, um, all these different producers were trying to outdo each other, which you kind of go into a little bit in the book. How did you find the whole, you know, the whole environment where these like Lou Adlers and Phil Spector's and Brian Wilson's were living? You know, talk a little bit about how you kind of tell that story and what you were thinking about when you were writing it. Well, of course, record production was a new occupation at that point. It really wasn't a well-defined position in the industry. Uh, it was, you know, Lou Adler was the first guy in L.A. to put his name on a record as a producer. 
So all that was just starting out. And these guys weren't so much record producers as we think of them today, as more generic record men. I mean, the difference between uh, uh, Phil Spector and Brian Wilson, who worked similarly, and Lou Adler is vast. Lou Adler uh, worked outside the studio. He knew songs, he had taste, he knew what musicians could do what, but he didn't put a stamp on those records. Uh, I, I don't think it was ever in him to do that. I, I think he made records that were good enough to do what he wanted them to do. But Spectre and, 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 and Brian were not just competing against each other. They were pushing the envelope, and, and, and to use a horrid cliche, uh, and, and just redefining the whole nature of pop music with almost every session. Uh, and, and, and that was locked in, brings into the whole thing, the, the competition with the Beatles, who were doing that same kind of cultural uh, energizing out of London. And that one comes up in the book because of Rubber Soul spurring Brian to make pet sounds and Bruce Johnston showing up in London with the advanced test pressings, Kim Fowley in the room and playing pet sounds for Paul McCartney and John Lennon. And then them rushing back to the studio. Um, to, to kind of try to copy that. Um, okay, let's get into one story that I love if we're talking about producers for a minute from the book. And that is the story that you have Phil Spector and Ike Turner and River Deep Mountain High into the Brian Wilson story. Do you mind just tantalizing these folks here with that story that you told around the one that was the huge failure and this whole idea of how to, you know, what were they gonna do with, uh, with good vibrations? Well, you know, you're such a smart lad, David. Uh, I never say that in the book. That that's just the juxtaposition of that, and the only mention of the of, of the correlation is that uh, uh, Brian, when he was losing faith in in good vibrations, which he worked on for like eight months, w was well aware of what happened to Phil's masterpiece. But both of these guys got lost in in giant. Uh, 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 masterpieces, uh, really large scale work, the types of which had never been done before. And Spectre, his was not met with success. For whatever reasons, uh, River Deep Mountain High, I think, uh, got up to like 88 on the charts. Yep, that's what and, it said. Uh, but Good Vibrations was the biggest hit that the Beach Boys ever had, and one of the biggest hits of that whole era. So the juxtaposition of those two self-conscious masterpieces was one of my little author's things, David. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, you know, for somebody who follows music, though, I mean, you're talking about this moment in time that everything was changing. You know, I didn't have time to look it up, but at one point in that era, we went from four tracks to eight tracks. And so, so the scope of your book, which you don't talk about necessarily, goes from two tracks to four tracks to eight tracks. You know, and all of the of the, of the, uh, the 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 adventure that like that 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 comes with, right? And so, you know, when you get to the part where they're doing good vibrations, you're doing mountain, you know, river deep, mountain high. You're talking about a lot more opportunity uh, sonically in the studio to cut these things. Two people on the top of their game. One one works and one completely fails. Both career defining. You know, both completely career defining. So that so, so to me, to me, that's one of the highlights of the book. You know, well, it's, hard to, it, it's hard to describe River Deep Mountain High as a failure. It just didn't get on the charts. Uh, the, I, the, I meant a failure as the charts. I mean, that's yeah. how they define themselves. That's how those people define themselves. Back I understand. Then. But the, uh, the, the record stands on its own. And indeed, uh, I think you're right. I think that Columbia was uh, eight track at that point. Yeah. I, I don't think the other studios were quite yet, but um, they were about to be. And you're, uh, Brian used studios as part of his composition. He would, you know, do the tracks at Gold Star, do the overdebs at, at Sunset Sound and, and, and the vocals at Columbia. Uh, all, all this was in his mind, uh, you know, part of his palette, his, his compositional palette. Yep. And, um, and again, it changed everything. It changed everything. And you had this Jan and Dean personality. And at one point in the book, you say wonderfully how those two characters worked interdependent on each other. You know, Brian marveled 
at Jan's dexterity and his charisma, and Jan marveled at Brian's genius. And, you know, and vice versa, too. And vice versa. Yeah, very much so. Brian, Brian uh, uh, and, and David Leaf put up a note. David's authored the classic Beach Boys biographies in, in the room uh, that, you know, remember, Brian Wilson wrote Surf City with Jan Berry. Actually right. wrote it with Brian Wilson, Roger Christian, and Dean Torrance, but he just neglected to leave, put those guys on the songwriting credit. So another sort of uh, Jan Berry, uh, uh, you know, um, hallmark uh picking well, I, who, I mean, who gets to write the songs uh, brian was just smitten with this group he sings on all their records he's he's in the studio playing on them he writes uh, uh he's you know he's on in dead man's curve he's in ride the wild surf uh yeah no that they were they were blended but you gotta remember that the beach boys started out as a jan and dean knockoff yeah that record surfing was just a sort of revamp of baby talk well, I actually love the way you frame the whole thing because the first time you, you see Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys meet each other, the Beach Boys are their backing band. I mean, that's pretty much what it is. And, 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 and the first thing that Jan says is, I want that song. And, and Brian has to tell him, you're not getting it. It's our next single. You know, I mean, that's, that's, you know, such, an, that's such an epic meeting that, that, you know, Thursday night Valentine's dance at some junior high. Who's our backup band? Oh, these guys, we've been hearing about them. Remember, they did the surfing record. And and th this is the moment in the movie where you know they 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 become transformed and they stand in the wings or whatever there was at the junior high school and watch the Beach Boys do their three surfing songs and go, that is us. You know they'd seen the future of rock and roll, yeah. and th that was just a, an an incredible scene to me and a, a pivotal uh, sock hop in rock and roll history. You know, a, a pivotal sock hop and Roy, I love that. Um, the other thing that's, that, that I just love about the book is that, you know, when people think about, you, you definitely sentimentalize the surf culture and yet there seems to be danger at every turn, right? So it's like, you know, the way that you've written this book, you, you foreshadow almost regularly what's gonna happen to Dean, which by the way, I don't have to give away that one. Everybody knows that that ending of that story, you know, and the dead man's curb and that horrible wreck. Was that intentional? Were you just saying to yourself, or were you just said you just, you, everywhere you looked, there were fires, there was death, there was, you know, this crazy kidnapping story, which by the way, I had no idea about. I certainly had, did not know that, that Jan was a part of it. You know? I don't, I, I, Jan, let, not so, Dean, I don't, Dean. I do not Dean. know. Dean why Dean was not indicted and tried. And yeah. if, if it had happened uh, uh, today, he would most certainly have been included. Uh, uh, only thing I can think of is Hollywood protects its own. But yeah, he, he was up to his tits in the Frank Sinatra Jr. kidnapping and no real uh, te telling what really happened there. That, that you, you know, this would be a good uh, uh, place where we could bring in a couple of guests here that we have. I would love it. I was actually going to go. Jill, Jill and Judith were both on the scene for that whole episode. And, and, you know, got it. That, that's that's a once in a lifetime event. <laughs> so can, can we bring them on? And, 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 you know, I think that the way that the law works is there's nothing you can say at this point in time that will incriminate you um, that hasn't been already said. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, Jill, I, I think you're on without being on camera. Are you there? I yeah. If, if you can hear me, I am. Oh, that's terrific. Um, so and, and Judith, Judith, welcome. You, we can all see thank you. you. Great to see Hi, you. David. Um, thank you for coming to our part to, to Joel's party. This is oh, good. wouldn't miss it. Um, so I think that what's amazing about this book as well. I want you to know, I just love this thing. I, I you know, I, I, I grew. I, I just got to just step aside for one second. Grew up in San Francisco. Grew up going to concerts, and then the next morning, kind of trying to figure out what Joel Selvin thought about what I saw the night before. <laughs> I mean, that's that's really the way that if you were growing up in the the, the 70s and 80s, and not not to age it, but like that 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 really was it. And and to see the stories that you've been telling since the Chronicle days and to, to the here comes the night and and the Altamont and all the ones I just I just love it and, and I, I think this one is just right up there I just think that's that it's that's sensational and one of the things that I love about this book is that 
you tell a story about a person named Jill Gibson, who's right here right now, who featured so prominently in the entire scene, who until your book has not been framed correctly for this, you know, um, it, you know, um, for I'll, I'll, Jill, I'll let you let you introduce that and then let Jill jump in. You know, what made you decide to tell Jill's story? Oh, Jill was the linchpin to doing the book. Uh, I, 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 she's uh, lives in the Bay Area. She's up in Pengrove now. I think um, she was closer when I, I met her in 2014. Uh, and uh, uh, asked her if um, she would participate in a book like this if I actually went ahead and did it. And she agreed to And When, when that happened, I, I really knew that this was going to be possible because it, this thing was such a boys club and there are uh, there, there's no real picture of this scene that includes females. And, and, and that's super important to me. So, you know, Jill's story was just incredibly key to to the whole thing and and she, she has i hope a real life role in the book beyond being somebody's girlfriend um ask ask judith about that uh, uh judith uh, witnessed this whole thing and she's read the book a couple couple three times she tells three me. times wow. three times yeah. well you know how how did how did i do with jill it always bothered me that jill never got what was coming to her. I mean that in the best way, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But it was, um, she was, she was not aware, I believe she was not aware of how talented she was. Hmm. And then being as beautiful as she was always got in the way of things. Not, you know, it got in the way because of other people, but she always had to sort of, you know, fight that off, which again, kept her out of the boys club, but she's as close as ever, anybody I know ever got. Yeah. That didn't, you know, that didn't marry anybody. Shelly Fabre married somebody. I, and and, and for, those, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, it's just, you know, Jill's connection to, I mean, there's so much to the Jan and Dean story and, 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 and how she performed there. The mamas and the papas story, uh, you know, I want to hear from you, Jill, about that one, but, and, and the Frank Sinatra Jr. kidnapping story and, <laughs> and, 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 and to the point of being there and going back to, to Jan in the hospital um, after suffering that, you know, the tragic, tragic uh, dead man's curve crash. Um, you were there for it all. And not only were you there for it all, but when you were asked to perform, you stepped up. Um, the first question I have for you, what was the high point for you musically that you were involved with during this whole scene? Oh boy, that's, that's the hard one because you might think I'd say the mamas and papas, but that I was- such after a, reading the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a real mixed bag, you know, so I, I wouldn't say that, but then what was, I, I'm really not sure. I think, um, you know, I just had a lot of fun. I, I always loved music. It's really my first love. And then uh, writing for Jan. I didn't write for Jan, but I was always writing music. And he would take my my songs and kind of re put a different beat to it or something, you know, and he would modify them in such a way. And I think that that was really the most fun I had in, in that whole time of uh, in the music business. I'd say that was my highlight. And being I, I, in the studio with with him actually, and you know, and uh, with the with the uh, Wrecking Crew, all, with all the you know, he formed the Wrecking Crew really for his songs, and then it went to and then it went to the Beach Boys. You know, Brian picked that up, but you know that that whole time was really great for me. I loved it. I spent a lot of time in the studio. There's some fantastic photos of Jill in uh, playing a, a rhythm guitar. Uh, right in the middle of all the Wrecking Crew guys, I'm, you know, it, it it's it's fantastic. It's it's you know, it's like a flower in a dung heap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my girl. <laughs> Jill, um, the to me, the story that Joel tells is of a couple people who had definite ambitions in the music industry, and the rest of them who, 
you know, we're just, you know, okay, well, I'll just go back to school if this isn't working out. Or I'm, I'm actually back in school right now and I'm just not going to deal with it and all that kind of stuff. Where do you fit in on that? Was there ever a moment that you had a, a vision for yourself as I want to be a recording artist? I want to do this professionally because I know oh, you can do that now. So, no, no, absolutely never. Never. I, I never wanted to be in the forefront of anything. I just liked writing music because I could do it by myself. I never liked, I mean, it's not like I didn't like performing, but I never aspired to be a performer or an entertainer or to be visible in any way in the music business. I just was very musical myself, loved to write and loved to hang out with people and create, but not oh. perform. Well, then what happened with the Mamas and the Papas? Because that was definitely a performing thing. I mean, you, you um, all of a sudden, and again, this is, a deep dive into the book so for all of you who haven't read it yet get ready for some good stuff but jill um what was it like to you know all of a sudden you know take over as uh you know as one of the leaders of the, the vocal group right when they were at their pinnacle of success well i think the reason i did it was because i loved their music so much and i mean i i kind of was a little worried about performing but it turned out not to be a problem uh, it was kind of fun, but uh, as I said, that the whole thing was such a mixed bag because there was Michelle always over here in the wings trying to get back in the group. I felt it um, while, meanwhile, I'm practicing songs that I loved singing and performing them. So, you know, it was just such a real mixed bag, this whole thing. And I'm not sure what the question was now. I think I lost the thread there. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. That, 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 is, that is the thread to, 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 to be at. Um, do you, you know, I know that you've gone on to other art forms and, and, you know, a whole other career. Do you still write songs? Do you still have, are you still doing it? No, no you know, I think when I moved to Europe, um, I kind of gave up music, you know, to, it, did, it didn't drag my guitar behind me. I just kind of just left the whole music world when I went to Europe and to live. And, Jill's uh, not one to yeah. toot her own horn. She's a widely <laughs> exhibited sculptor and painter. Yes. And she makes a uh, uh, very beautiful uh, jewelry, which she sells uh, and is lived a life of an artist. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's why I was out to be an artist and I wasn't a performer. I was, a, you know, artist kind of behind the scenes as an artist. And uh, I did find myself in Hollywood actually producing music, but then I saw, I just realized this is not what I am. I, I'm an artist. And then I, that's when I went to New York and, and pursued painting, which I had been done, doing for years on the side. And I decided to pursue that as a career. So uh, yeah, and, and then there was a lot of things, you know, Jan had his accident, you know, I broke up with Lou because we had been together. And there's a lot of things happening that just, it was time to leave, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I went to New York to study art. To study painting it sounds like a very crazy moment i mean at least in the it book it was crazy a lot happened in a short amount of time yeah and you know when you're in it you don't you don't really you don't see it you, you know it's, it's easy to look at it all from now you know hindsight but um you know when you're in it one thing leads to another and then you know you're just on a path and you just keep going and I ended up just leave, leaving the whole scene. You know, there was a lot of stuff, that, a lot, a lot of stuff that made me leave the whole. I didn't like the music business. I didn't like a lot of the people involved. I didn't like the way people dealt with each other. I didn't like all the, you know, just there's a lot of stuff that I didn't like about it. And the, so all, so all of you music leave. people online right now, just remember what you just heard. <laughs> 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 um, David, you know, I would also like to introduce to everybody uh, somebody that was there at the very beginning of this um, idea of a book. Uh, if Jill was the person that was the linchpin and made me like say, I can do this, the, I had been talking the idea over with Charlie Winton. Charlie was the editor and publisher of my B Burt Burns biography, Here Comes the Night. And, and Hollywood Eden benefits uh, from having two editors. Charlie was the American editor and uh, Doug Richmond, who's out there in the gallery somewhere is the Canadian editor. So th th this book has been handled but like a baby 
the whole time by brilliant, wonderful people. And I, I want Charlie to take a bow. There he is. Charlie and Barbara. Charlie and 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 also uh, Doug, if you want to jump in, when you when you uh, read the book, when you heard the idea, and again, many of these stories have been told before, not like this. You know, what were you thinking? Well, you know, the the Burt Burns book was a very successful book and a super fun book to work on with Joel. It was extremely complex, um, and um, and then I went through uh, you know some. Uh, career changes where I sold my publishing company. And so when Joel first pitched um, Hollywood Eden or what would become Hollywood Eden, I don't think the book had a title at that particular juncture, uh, but I could obviously see the similarity between uh, Here Comes the Night. It was the LA, ver in some ways it was the LA version of Here Comes the Night, but instead of being centered on one character or having one single character, Burt Burns to drive the book, we had multiple characters, which actually made it more appealing and on some level more, more you know, ultimately it would be more challenging. Um, so anyway, it took uh, a few years for us to find a home after I had sort of retired from owning publishing companies uh, to, for me to find a home for it that would kind of go with uh, the unusual thing of having a guest editor. Uh, normally the publisher would buy it and they would edit the book themselves. But anyway, we, we, we convinced them that that the way to go from the start, um, but you know, it was is a fabulous story it, with, in terms of having so many different characters, and then just as, as you guys have already covered the fact that you know everybody comes from this kind of uh, you know they're all in high school together, and and nobody's thinking uh, you know in the fall of 1957 when they're singing in the shower, nobody's thinking about having a music career, right? It's all just organic evolution and then that you draw in you know Adler, Herb Albert, Phil Spector you know and some of the even Steve Douglas you know all of these people who are Lee Hazelwood what Lee Hazelwood we haven't even talked no, about Lee, Lee Hazelwood, Hazelwood or, or Nancy Sinatra yeah or, or, or well or then that, that, that even you have a book that has you know Franks in it and then the kidnapping was one of my I mean that was uh I remember as a kid, I, I, I was about 10 years old when the kid, or nine years old when the kidnapping happened, and I remembered it, and I remembered it as stupid as it is in the book, you know, like here, here they've got Frank Sinatra's kid, and they want like, you know, $43. <laughs> and Frank had already said he'd give a million, he already said it. <laughs> and then when Joel teased out all the details, you know, Frank Sinatra going to the payphone in Carson. Oh, the payphone, that's my favorite. <laughs> you got you to tell them. You got to tell the people. You got to tell the yeah, people. The, the, the kidnappers, uh, they, they picked a gas station in Carson City out of a phone book and told him that, you know, they were going to call there. And Carson City was a little farther away from Reno than, than, than they realized. And so they called and the gas station owner picks up the phone and they, Frank Sinatra there? <laughs> God, you know, <laughs> and it happens like three times. And the, after the third time, Frank Sinatra pulls up in a car and, and a car full of FBI agents behind him. And he comes out and he says to the gas station owner, I'm Frank Sinatra. If I had any calls. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, it, 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 I have to say it's really interesting because um, there's so much we've talked about but there's so much we haven't. And, and one of the ways that you write, Joel, and I really appreciate it is you keep the story going while you incorporate so much information uh, with every sentence that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a masterclass in the history of whatever it is you're talking about. And, it, and, 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 you, and you make it fun because you really incorporate, you, the, the plot still goes, you know. Well, thank you, David. I, I think before everybody falls asleep, we should see if there's any questions. I, I, was, I was just about to open it up for questions, even though I have more questions, but let other people have a shot, I think. I'll ask you later. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions for, the, for, this, for this crew? For this post-wrecking crew? <laughs> Well, you know, I have a question while you guys are thinking of oh, we got one. We got wait, we got one. Yeah. We got one. Angel. Angel, you're on mute. Okay, thank you. 
So I'm curious, you know, given how, you know, humanity doesn't change radically, I don't think, but, but times have changed and the music industry has changed. So um, in terms of the uh, stories that you shared, which are amazing, um, what are like, what are some of the experiences that you think that was like a moment in time and that's like unlikely to ever be replicated? Or do you think some of those stories probably still happen today? Oh, no, I do not. I, I think this was a very specific time in history. And I, I do not think that uh, 16 year olds are gonna graduate from singing in the showers to uh, uh, the top 10 in under six months ever again. Uh, uh, the, the kind of ability to dream your life up and, and, and just have it happen. It's uh, an American fantasy and, and, and it came true for some of these people. Now, of course, there's always another side to the promise fulfilled because they come with bills. And that, that's one of the things these people did not realize. So when the bills came, it, it, it was a, an entirely different experience. Mm -hmm. You make that very clear. Elliot. Well, Spud wants to know if I spoke to Rodney Bingheimer, who's been plugging my book. And, uh, you know, uh, not about this particular project, uh, you, you know, but you can't spend too much time on the uh, sidewalks of Sunset Boulevard before you speak to Rodney Bingheimer. And, and, and Rodney and Fowley used to hang. Yeah, they were a, yeah, they were a fabulous duo, yeah. Oh, Elliot. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jill, this is for you. Can you describe what it was like being in the studio with Jan? Maybe how he worked with two drummers, Earl Palmer, Hal Blaine, what the rapport was like with Tommy Tedesco, all those amazing cats. And really, I think Jan has his own place in studio brilliance. You know, at Jan's wake, I made a statement that I felt Jan should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, at least as producer. So maybe you could just talk about some of those amazing times in the studio. Well, I think you're right about that, of being in the Hall of Fame as a producer. I mean, he really was uh, an innovator in that, in that regard. And, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to, I have nothing to compare it to, you know, I mean, I. I went in the studio with him and there, there everybody was. And it just seemed absolutely normal to me. It didn't seem anything out of the ordinary. Um, and I remember, um, now I'm forgetting names. Uh, God, the piano player who ended up being famous, you know. Um, Leon Russell. Leon Russell, yeah. I mean, you know, he was just a, he was just really a cool guy. Never spoke, you know, just did his thing and then Next thing I know, I'm after I came back from Europe, he's got a long white beard. He's, you know, a star. And, you know, it's like really bizarre, you know. But, the, but in the studio itself, it was, you know, everything functioned so well. And Jan just managed everything so well. And, you know, I spent, uh, you know, we, we lived together and I would watch him write out everything for everybody. In fact, I did some of the copy uh, stuff with uh, George Tipton. You know, I did a lot of the, Copying, what do you call that? When you write out the scores for people. Through um, the charts. The charts, yeah. Well, he, you know, he, he would do all this work. I mean, he, you know, it's, it's, I was just used to Jan being a genius, not realizing it was a genius, you know, just uh, <laughs> doing it all, you know, and then going into the studio and putting everything, you know, just, just orchestrating the whole thing. It was just amazing. And, and if I may, and how fun. is it recording your own selections? Like like Jilly's B what? side and it's as easy as one two three. What was it like recording your own compositions? Um, you, know, you know, I'll tell you. Uh, I can't remember. I, I really don't remember recording those things. I just don't. Collectors really love that. Uh, you know that that single. It's very rare and coveted among Jan and Dean collectors. But and it's a beautiful melody, yeah. by the way. Hey, I can't believe <laughs> that Jan and Dean aren't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Not that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is something that we're going to take too seriously to begin with, but I, what? You know, I, what? I, didn't, I didn't I didn't realize they weren't. That's insane. You know, that is. is insane. But I think that when Jan had an had had this accident, I think a lot of just a lot of energy just left that that them. You know, yep. I think that's partly why. 
I, yep. I, the energy I, just fell out. Neither did Dale too. I mean, you knew a lot of people. I mean, one of the things that you realize when you're listening to the music as you're reading the book is there was a couple of moments where like, oh, wait, that's right. That's a Jan and Dean song. I thought that was a Beach Boys song. Or, oh, that's a Beach Boys song. I thought that was a Jan and Dean yeah. song. It was, it was. You're, so you're forgiven, David, because the Beach Boys do Jan and Dean songs in their set now as if they were did them in the first place. And now here's little old lady from Pasadena. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> Mike Love, good guy, not. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, you any other questions? Says, uh, 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 old timers disease is, that's when you can't remember whose act you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I got a question for you. Um, how long did it take to research this book? Well, it, it, you never know when the research started, right? I mean, hearing Surf City on the radio in 1963 counts. But one thing I would like to mention is that this book is greatly informed by many, many hours of conversation with the late, great Steve Douglas, the saxophone player who was on all these records. He was a very dear friend. He moved up to the Bay Area in the 70s, and we spent a ton of time together, I'm happy to say, before he died in like 1994, I think. Uh, and a lot of what is in that book is formed from information and in those conversations with Steve, and I just wish mm -hmm. I could add more. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just looking at your uh, screenshot. You got your Ventures uh, poster in the background. I mean, you know, this research has been going on for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the book uh, itself started to form in 2014. And 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 really the, the key event was meeting Jill and, and, and gaining her uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, from there on, Charlie had his own problem finding a, a, a publishing house. But I got to say, he couldn't have found a better one. This uh, was a Canadian firm called House of Anansi, and I have never had a better experience with any publishing company. The editors, the copy uh, editors, the marketing people, everybody, all the way up to the top. They've just been fabulous. And, they, and this is not a, this is a little bit outside their normal book. So this is an experiment for them, and I, and I, and I hope it's successful. <laughs> All right. Well, um, any other questions for this? Because that's a great way to end. <laughs> any other questions, though, before we uh, before we tie this one up? No. All right. Well, listen, um, I don't know if you see this in the chat, but you have autographed copies available at Copperfields in Petaluma. Um, and I'm sure, you know, as the world opens up, Joel will be very willing to sign books. Oh, I'll be going door to door. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i just i just want to i want to thank um that our time is 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 coming to an end i want to i want to just thank everybody who's on here jill thank you so much for sharing your story judith i actually have more questions for you judith also came from a hollywood family and experienced this craziness i think we're gonna have to have you back just to talk to you about your <laughs> about, about what, what went on with you you know and and charlie i think you and i met at one of joel's famous thanks post Thanksgiving uh, dinners a long, long time. Good to see you again. And just, uh, it's good to see everybody out there um, who either had a part in this, just as a fan of this, or is continuing to muscle on with this music stuff, um, listening to this tale that is so quintessential to the American music fabric. And, and Joel, I just wanna just tell you something. I, I'm so thankful that you keep, you know, figuring out these great stories to tell us, even ones that, contain inside them things that we already knew, but putting them in a way that really help us make us make them, you know, these living, breathing, beautiful things that you do. And uh, congratulations on your book coming out today. It's just what an incredible, incredible thing it is. So thank you, David. I hope that my books all contain a kernel of what it was like to actually be the people I'm writing about. That, that, that's what I feel. That's what I feel. So I can't thank all of you enough. This is a very uh, illustrious crowd. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm super impressed and flattered. And, and uh, my humble thanks to all of you. I know that going on a Zoom meeting to listen to some author uh, talk about his book, 
you know, it's pretty low on the entertainment scale. So depends on who you are. <laughs> I appreciate you, every one of you showing up tonight. Yeah. Thank Thanks for writing the book, Joel. Yeah, thank you. And Colleen, thank you to, for hosting us. And we're dedicating to are we are we dedicating tonight to Brian Rohan? I think we're dedicating the the evening to Brian Rohan. Brian Rohan. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you all. We'll see you soon. Joel, we'll have you at the battery as soon as we can. And we'll Can't do wait. a recap of all this. Y'all stay safe. We'll see you soon. Thank Boom. you, everybody.